Hey everyone, I'm Justin, creator of the Fabrication Series YouTube channel, and welcome to Weld Coach. Now, if you've booked a class with one of our coaches involving welding aluminum or AC TIG, you're going to need to know a little bit of theory going into it so we don't waste a lot of time during your lesson. So stick with me here through this episode. It's actually kind of a fun topic. It's Weld Coach, your personal welding instructor, anywhere. Now, aluminum is actually my favorite metal to weld. It has this unique ability to grow a protective shell around the outside of it, known as the oxide layer. And how it does this instantly is part of the challenge of dealing with this. Now, some people actually call this the invisible layer, but fun fact of it, if you're looking at aluminum, you're actually staring at aluminum oxide, the oxide layer itself. You can't typically differentiate the two of them or separate the two of them and see the core layer. There's a couple of instances or circumstances, if you will, where you can actually see the difference between the two of them. One of those is if it's molten. So if you ever look at somebody who's casting some aluminum into, let's say, a mold or something, if you look carefully at the molten aluminum pouring out of it, you'll see like a skin around the outside of it that just kind of stays a solid while the core layer pours through it. It's kind of like looking at an aluminum foil tube, if you will. Another instance is if you're in an area where there's a lot of salinity in the air, you'll probably look at a piece of aluminum and see that it's got like an ashiness to it, or the appearance of it in general is like a dull, hazy gray with that ashy layer on the outside of it. That's the oxide layer, and it's being attacked by the atmosphere. The third way to see the difference is if you look at a piece of aluminum that's been welded. If you look around the weld bead, you'll see a white, ashy kind of ring around the outside of it. And that's the oxide layer that's getting electrically broken by the arc of the machine itself. Now, what makes this so challenging to work with is that core layer has a much different melting temperature than the oxide layer that's protecting it. The core layer has a melting temperature somewhere in the 1,200 degree Fahrenheit range, whereas the oxide layer has a melting temperature somewhere in the 3,700 degree Fahrenheit range. Now, this is going to be different between the grades or who you ask and what they remember or what the textbooks were written at the time and, of course, you know, how the aluminum personally feels deep down inside because sometimes you swear this stuff is, is completely alive. But nevertheless, it's safe to say that the oxide layer has a melting temperature that's roughly three times the melting temperature of the core layer that it's protecting. Now, when we're talking about welding, we're often referencing the electrode polarity, and that tells us the direction the current is traveling in. Now, the hardest thing for a lot of people to grasp is that electricity or current travels from negative to positive. It does not travel positive to negative. This is counterintuitive, especially if you've ever hooked up a car battery in your time. You're always like, watch out for the positive terminal. You know, electrons are going to blow up and explode out of it, right? Well, it's actually the other way around. The current is traveling through the chassis and it's trying to get to the positive terminal. In TIG welding, our electrode is going to be our tungsten. In MIG welding, our electrode is our wire. And in stick welding, our electrode is the, well, the stick. That's, they're called electrodes. And to do you a solid here, if you ever see this come up on a test, there is no polarity for oxyacetylene welding. It's a trick question. But either way, if we're electrode negative, or EN, that means the current is traveling from the torch down into the work. Now, if we were to fire at a piece of aluminum, and let's say DC, electrode negative, we're going to find that the core layer is going to melt away before the oxide layer does. The result of this is kind of like a big puddle of goo with like a little film or something sitting over the top of it or like a skin. Now you can poke this stuff, prod it, stir at it, try to do whatever you want with it, but it's not going to go away. And if we ever did get it to the point where the oxide layer was getting, you know, to the point where it can melt or whatever, the rest of your table or your workbench is going to look like something out of Terminator 2. It's going to be messy. Electrode negative is great for getting down into the core layer, but it doesn't do anything with the oxide layer, so it's not the most practical thing in the world. So naturally, we flip this around. Let's go electrode positive, or EP. That means the current is traveling from the work into the torch. Now, tungsten has a melting temperature somewhere around the 8,000 degree Fahrenheit range or so, which is why we use it as an electrode. But the arc that we're working with here has been clocked somewhere north of 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit in some situations. Not to mention here, look at where the current is going. If this entire surface is electrified, that means all of it is trying to blast its way up into that tungsten. It just flat out can't withstand it. It literally explodes. It's, it's a spectacular thing to watch as long as you're not getting sprayed by molten tungsten, right? 
But if we look carefully back at it, you can see that the electrode positive side has enough power and oomph, if you will, to break that oxide layer away or to effectively melt it. But it doesn't do anything to get down into the core layer. And for a fun fact on this one, the electrode negative side in that last clip was fired at 100 amps. The electrode positive side was still fired at 100 amps, but it only took about a quarter of it, roughly 23 to 25 amps, to blow that tungsten up. It's not the most stable thing in the world. So if we can't use either one of them directly or by themselves, the only solution is to use both of them. And the only way that we're going to get both of them is with alternating current, or AC. With AC, we have a positive side and we have a negative side. We're going to go up into the positive side to break the oxide layer away in a cycle, and then we're going to transition down to the negative side to penetrate down into it. So what this basically means is on the positive side, we're going to blast away the oxide layer, basically removing it, something like that. And once we transition down to the negative side with the oxide layer already gone, it welds like any other metal. Our positive side is referenced as our cleaning side, and our negative side is referenced as our penetration side. And that's why we use alternating current for welding aluminum. Now, a little bit of a history lesson. If you were one of those people, let's say back in the day, that was an AC TIG welder or one that could weld aluminum, you were the best. You were like the top dog. You were the greatest of all great welders in the world. Now, it's not like aluminum was all that difficult to weld, but it's just that what we were given to weld it with was relatively primitive. I mean, what we had is basically what came out of the wall. So to kind of put it into perspective here, if I take the leads out of the welding machine and I plug them directly into the socket of the wall and pump argon through it, that's how much control we had. What came out of the wall, at least here in North America, was a 60 hertz sine wave at 50-50 balance. Now the sine wave was the first pesky problem that we had to deal with here. If you look at this graph here, this height being the maximum amperage that we attain out of it or achieve out of it over the course of time, this length on it here, we'll look and see that we have zero amps starting out and as we ramp up to our peak amperage, whatever we dialed into the machine or wherever our foot pedal is positioned at that point, that amperage is constantly changing. It's a different number as it goes up. And once it hits that peak, only for a brief moment in time, it ramps back down again. We'll cross over to zero on the positive side, and then we'll transition to the negative side, and of course we'll ramp up to the peak there, and then we'll ramp back down 60 times every single second, or 60 hertz. Now, we'll get into frequencies in just a moment here, but 60 hertz is a relatively low frequency. More work happens at a lower frequency, which basically means that our weld pool is gonna grow really fast and run away from us if we don't try to keep up with it or if our speed wasn't really on point where it should be. But that ever-changing amplitude output is just like riding a roller coaster. You're never at the same elevation. With a sine wave, we were never at the same amperage output, which means our foot pedal was kind of dancing around a little bit. A 50-50 balance meant that half the time the tungsten is trying to explode. The other half the time it's trying to solidify. And the result was this big pesky like Tootsie Pop looking ball that would form on the end of the tungsten. And it was going to be there no matter what. Common practice back in the day used to be when you changed out your tungsten or whatever, you would fire it off on a block of metal or something that was on the side to shape that ball and intentionally put it there because it was going to be there no matter what. But the biggest problem with the ball on the end of the tungsten is that it was never really a solid and it was never quite really a liquid either. It would just kind of quiver on there. But if you take the most common law of electricity and the fact that it travels the path of least resistance on a spherical shape, that means that it will grab anywhere it feels like it. Or more specifically, it will grab anywhere the argon touches on the part. Which means you had to have the absolutely pristine, perfectly tight arc length in order to control that or to pinpoint and focus it where it really needed to go. So that way you had the most control. So to recap here, if you were on an old school sine wave unit or an old transformer unit with limited control, you had to have a dancing foot so that way you can constantly find the average amount of amplitude that machine would produce. At a low frequency, you had to be like flying through that part in order to let it not run away from you. And your arc length had to be ridiculously tight. But at the end of the day, there was nothing in this world that we couldn't weld with this setup. It was thick, it was thin, it was like tight corners. It doesn't matter what it was, it was pure skill. And that's why back in the day, you were like the best of the best if you could weld aluminum with TIG. Now, if things had not changed, we would still be running this way. But thankfully for people like you and everybody else who wants to learn, and even me at one point in time, 
things have gotten a little bit easier. The biggest thing that made that, or the biggest change to the industry that I like to recognize, was the introduction of the square wave. Now, unlike the sine wave, the square wave goes up to its peak amperage, it stays at that amperage, and then it flip-flops straight to the other side, it stays at that amperage, and then we repeat cycle. Now, the greatest thing about this is that if I ask for, like, let's say, 100 amps on a square wave machine, I get 100 amps, exactly what I asked for. On a sine wave unit, if I dialed in 100 amps to it or asked for 100 amps, I would get 100 amps, but only for one 120th of one second, twice. If I wanted to weld the equivalent value of 100 amps out of the sine wave unit, I'd have to dial in 180 to 200 amps just so I can get the average amount of amplitude that that waveform would produce. It was terribly inefficient. That's why you could see like these old transformer units that required like two men and a boy to move it a, a foot closer to the table so you could reach your part. They were like 400 amp output with a 100 amp you know, service requirement input and they maxed out at like quarter inch. The square wave units are effectively more powerful because they require a lot less input to give it the same amount of output. It's pretty impressive. Now you'd be really hard pressed to find a sine wave in a unit in a, like a factory form, like as in that's the only unit it produces. The square wave units have basically made the sine wave units almost completely obsolete. Even today's transformer units are square wave equipped machines. Now, sometimes you might find a machine that has got this as like an optional wave shape or an optional waveform output. Some machines do have multiple waveform outputs. But to be honest with you, I haven't actually found a reason in all of these years to intentionally use a sine wave. Unless it was for like, I don't know, um, nostalgia? Wanted to remember what it was like? That's about it. Now, there are some companies that do advertise a soft square waveform or a wave shape. And that basically means that they just kind of lop the corners off of the side of the wave or maybe they put like a little peak over the top. I, I've seen it done both ways. Now, I've read the literature. I've used both of these waveforms and wave shapes. And of course, I've listened to sales pitches and people's opinions and even read some pubs on it. But I'll be honest with you, I can't find any reason to suggest that it's advantageous to use a soft wave over a regular wave or a regular square wave. I mean, it's... There's really nothing to it. I mean, it's kind of the same thing. Now, I do speculate, you know, this is just me on my side, on my opinion, that the only reason that the soft square exists, in all honesty, is to shut everybody up when it came to switching them from the sine wave over to the, the square wave, because audibly, the sine wave is kind of soft, along with the soft square. So that's about all I can say that's uh, useful for is, you know, it sounds a little cooler. So if you have a soft square machine, cool. If you have a regular square wave machine, Cool. They effectively do the exact same thing. So try not to make it like a sales pitchy, you know, tip you over the edge kind of thing if you're searching for a machine. Now the first time a square wave was put into an inverter unit was back in 1993 by Sanrex. Maybe it was 1994. But it wasn't until like the mid 2000s, maybe 2010s plus, when they started becoming a really big thing. But long before all of that, one of the greatest inventions or the greatest changes to the welding industry was actually created in the 1970s by Miller. What Miller basically did was look at this waveform and say, well, the positive side's just there for breaking away the oxide layer and it doesn't take half the cycle to do it. So what if we subtract a little bit of time spent on that positive side and then just apply the remainder of that cycle down to the negative side? And this is where AC balance was born. AC balance is the relationship of the positive wave to the negative wave over one cycle. What they basically did was subtract some of the time spent on the positive side, using it for just the amount of time they needed to break the oxide layer away, and then throw the rest of it down to the negative side. And what we gained out of this was something else. The biggest gain from AC balance was even more efficiency. Think of it this way, if we spend less time blasting away at our tungsten, wasting time, and we spend more time digging down into that core layer, we effectively gain more power for even less requirement now. Think of it more like an equivalent value, if you will. If, let's just say this is a 100 amp wave, and we have more time down on the bottom of it, for that 100 amps, we get more result out of it. So it's more like an equivalent value of like 105, 110 amps, or something like that. That's just kind of a general idea. It's not necessarily measured that way, but it is more more efficient and that's a fantastic thing. The second thing that we gained out of this was actually a loss and it was the best loss that we could have, one that we're not even crying about. You remember how I said earlier that we used to have to ball the tungsten before we actually started welding because it was going to be there no matter what? 
Well, now we don't have to do that almost at all because scientifically speaking, there's less time trying to blast that tungsten away so it doesn't melt as bad. But the best part of maintaining that taper there is actually getting into something like a, you know, like a T-joint or something like that. Back in the day with that gigantic ball or whatever the case is, electricity will take the path of least resistance, which means it's going to grab high on the wall or pretty far away from the root on the floor. And in order to get a proper penetrating joint, we have to make sure that down into the root where both pieces of metal touch are completely liquid. That's a big giant glob of molten aluminum metal. And what we used to do back in the day was take a big giant bar or a freaking you know, filler rod that was huge and just stuff it right back in there. We just kind of crawled along that joint. But with the taper now on the tungsten and just a slightly blunted over tip, we don't have that big of a uh, expansion of the arc or whatever the case is. We can get in a lot tighter. That's less degradation of the walls, less heat affected zone, a lot faster travel speed. Oomph, like here we go. This stuff is awesome. That's why again, we don't ball the tungsten anymore. Now, what most people just want to know is, what are your settings? Well, I hate to be the one to break it to you. You can set the machine wherever you want, and you still have the same probability of success or failure because it's not a microwave. You can't just go bleep, bleep, bleep and expect to get what you thought you were going to get. What we use to set the machine up are what we call references. Those references are often based on preferences. And those preferences are what you find on the internet when you're doing a deep dive Google search or you're looking in Facebook groups taking a lot of notes. Have you noticed that you have like several different pages of different numbers and stuff like that to put on there? Or maybe you've even tried to use those settings and you found that it just didn't work out? Well, that's because you need to learn how to weld. Luckily, there is a universal type of reference that we use that works on virtually every machine. And as far as balance control is considered, that is 30% positive to 70% negative. Now, 3070 is kind of a general reference, if you will. It's mostly reserved for clean, prepped, and ready to weld aluminum, right? There are some instances where you might have to turn it up or turn it down or whatever the case is, but it's not like a, a, a serious rule. It's more like a general thing. Again, these are all based on preference, but 3070 is the place to start. So if you ever want to change it around or you want to start messing with the balance control settings or whatever the case is, always move in blocks of five. So if you're like 3070, I want a little bit more positive side on that. I want to see what the change is going to be if I go a little more positive. Then try 3565. And if you're working on something super dirty or very uh, porous, like cast aluminum, for example, you'll definitely want to be in the 4060 range. And if maybe you're like, okay, I want to try to get a little bit less of that etching line around my bead and really tighten it up, then you might try 2575. Always try the block of five move and understand that later on down the road, when you've got more seat time and more hood time welding, you'll see the difference between something like 30 and 31. So as a quick example of that, my former instructors and I used to argue about our instructor machine that we all use during my classes. I liked the machine setting at balance at 33, they liked it at 34. And you better bet we'd be arguing between each other throughout the course of the day, just kind of joking around because one of us messed with our settings. Either way, 3070 will get you going exactly where you need to be, but the hard part is going to be figuring out which side of it your machine references. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day which side of the machine yours, you know, your, your machine references or which side it operates on, it does the exact same thing. But you got to know which one yours runs on. Or maybe you jumped on a buddy's machine and you want to make sure you understand where the settings are on that, or you get a new machine, there's no manual, or it's written in Chinese, whatever the case is, who knows. There's a quick and easy way to find out which side of the machine it operates on, which balance control operates on. Now the first thing you want to do is check the leads. It doesn't matter what metal you're welding. Every single metal under the sun, no matter the polarity process or whatever the case is, is all going to be welded in electronegative orientation. That means that the torch is in the negative, the clamp is in the positive. This never changes for any reason whatsoever, including if you're switching to AC. If you switch to AC, you don't switch the leads. You keep it in electronegative orientation. So again, torch negative, clamp positive. Once you have verified that is correct, set the dial to 70 on the machine and step on the pedal. If the tungsten explodes, turn it back to 30. That's how you figure out which side the machine operates on. Now, if AC balances the relationship of the positive wave to the negative wave over one single cycle, how many times we go from positive to negative every single second is our frequency, 
Now, it used to be that we were locked in at 60 hertz, or at least here in North America, we were locked at 60 hertz because that's what our grid gave us. But these days, we have the ability to change that around. We can choose a different frequency for what we want to weld with. Now, if you look in the books or check some stuff out online or whatever the case is, they'll typically suggest that a lower frequency will net a wide arc characteristic, which basically means bigger, hotter, snottier weld pool, and that a higher frequency would be a narrow arc characteristic, which basically means tighter, cooler, more controllable weld pool. But the problem with that is, is everything we do in welding is all based on time. The longer you sit there, the more something is going to happen. So let's just do a quick little experiment. Let's put a 20 hertz frequency here, which is considered very low, and a 200 hertz frequency here, which is considered relatively high. And let's run them at the exact same speed. The result we achieved out of this one is going to be just like the book suggests. It's gonna be a wide low frequency and a narrow high frequency. But let's speed up the 20 hertz and slow down the 200 hertz. Notice any difference? The result is the exact opposite. But why? Well, it's because lower frequencies generate more energy. They have more power sitting behind them. So for the same amount of time that you're sitting on there, they do more work than a higher frequency, which is bouncing back and forth so rapidly. So ultimately, after all of this information comes in and out of your head and the confusion comes in and you think you got it, you just want to know where do you set the machine? Well, ideally, you're looking for a frequency as a general reference to be something that is not too low of a frequency where you're freaking out and just trying to catch up with it, and it's not too high of a frequency where you're just sitting there waiting for something to happen. As a general rule and reference of what we usually set the machines to, 120 hertz will get just about every single job done. But what are some instances where you might want a lower frequency or a higher frequency? Well, let's take thin metals, for example. The higher frequency is not going to produce as much energy over that amount of time, which means you can traverse your, your very thin metal part, which will get really hot really quick at a more normal pace, right? We used to do them back in the day just like this with the 60 hertz frequency, but we'd have to fly through that thing, right? So if you don't want to get all fatigued and completely exhausted and you'd like to keep a nice and tight focused arc on it, you'll want higher frequencies for thinner metals. There's not really a general rule, it's just a preference. Some instances where you might want a lower frequency, it's, well, the opposite, thick metals. Let's just say that, no, oh, I don't know, you got a 200 amp machine and uh, you're trying to do quarter inch aluminum and it's a pretty big piece, right? That's gonna be kind of ambitious for a machine like that, or at least that low of an output. So if you ask the internet right now, they'll probably tell you to go out and get a cylinder of helium. And, you know, side note, they're absolutely correct. If you get some helium, like real pure welding helium, and you mix it in with your argon, or even if you run it straight, you're gonna have an equivalent value amperage. And I believe with helium, it's 1.7 to 1. So that basically means if you did 100 amps with 100% helium, it'll be the same as running 170 amps with 100% argon. It's hot stuff, but it's extremely expensive stuff. And this is not the same as going down to like Party City and getting the balloon can. It's totally different. That stuff's mostly nitrogen. Pure welding helium is ridiculously expensive because it is a scarce gas. We're talking like a 220 cubic foot cylinder, like those ones that are sitting behind me over here. Those things will set you back somewhere around eight to 800 to a thousand dollars. And that's not, that's a lot of money to spend on a job that you're just going to do once or whatever the case is, right? So instead you can just drop the frequency as low as it possibly goes and you'll see that it starts to cut its way into it and starts to dig out all of that and kind of get into it, whatever the case is, right? So. To recap, high frequencies for thinner metals, low frequencies for thicker metals. But as I mentioned earlier, this is preference. It is entirely up to you where you want to set the frequency to. Just make sure you're honest with yourself about where it operates at, because if you're trying to do quarter inch on 200 plus hertz, it ain't gonna work, right? So you gotta understand that it's, you know, you'll find your spot. Now, if you ask me, I like a little bit lower frequency. The reason why is because this is how I learned how to weld. And in all honesty, when the inverter technology came along, I was like, nah, pff, forget all that technology BS. I'm a real welder, right? That was my attitude. And then eventually I pulled my head out of my ass and I said, wow, this has got to be the greatest thing I've ever seen. What an unbelievable amount of control we have with it, right? But my discipline was based on this, which means it's hot and heavy. That basically means that I have my amps jacked way up. My speed is really, really fast. My arc length is super, super tight. My job is to get in, out, hello, goodbye. That's how I weld. So as my daily driver kind of set up on my frequency, I like it to be about 90 hertz. 
I can weld it on any frequency you want, but if you ask me, I like 90. But I recommend 120 because that fits in just about every single thickness of metal that the average person is, is gonna weld from let's just say like, ooh, I don't know, a quarter inch on down. You can usually get away with it. Just to remember that this is where we are now and this is where we were. And they both take a great deal of skill, but thankfully this is a lot easier. Now the next question usually comes up is amperage. Where do you actually set the machine? Now some people would suggest what they call loading the pedal. That means if you have, let's say, a 200 amp machine, put all 200 amps on that pedal because you have the range control. Well, yes, technically you do have that full control over it, but let's just say you only were working in a 60 amp range for like, you know, 116 thickness. You know, having a 200 amp pedal means you're gonna have a range this big on it. Whereas if you target it to 60 amps where you needed it, you got that much range to work on it. That's a heck of a lot easier to control than this little teeny tiny amount of it, right? We're looking for better resolution. So you always wanna target your amperage to what your thickness is. And that general rule is going to be one amp per one thousandth of an inch of thickness or 40 amps per millimeter. There we go. This is where you wanna target your amperage to don't load your pedal up. You'll have a lot better control out of what you're doing if you just set it or target it to where you want. If that's the only knob you have to change on your welder, so be it, that's the way it goes. Now, there is one more wave that I like to discuss because just like other machines, you have talked about different waveforms being available and this one shows up in some of them occasionally. It's kind of like a combination of the sine wave and the square wave. It's called the triangle wave. Now, like the sine wave, it kind of goes up and peaks that main amperage for a brief moment in time, but more like the square wave, its transition between positive and negative is just instantly. It's just boom. It's not slopey or anything. It's more like a game of ping pong or something. The beauty of the triangle wave is that it still has the power to break that oxide layer away, effectively removing it, but unlike any other wave, it kind of just sits on top and just, you know, barely scratches the surface, if you will. It doesn't have a whole lot of power or oomph to really dig down in the metal like a square wave or even a sine wave for that matter. So what are some instances where you might want to use the triangle wave? Well, one of my favorites is, let's just say, ridiculously thin metals. At that point, you can just glide right across the top of those things and be, you know, just fine all day long. Another instance, machining repairs. Let's say you have a really ridiculously thin section or something like that and you just need to build up some metal and not necessarily dig down into it, triangle waves are great for that. Sometimes you'll be on some ridiculously thin metals or you'll be in an area where there's not a lot of surface area of that aluminum and you gotta keep it nice and tight and not really just blow through it or whatever the case is, triangle waves are great for that. However, I do caution people that triangle waves are a tool, they're not a crutch. So if you can't weld without one, it's not gonna do you much good to try and weld with one. But if you don't have a triangle wave, don't worry too much about it. If you jack the frequency up on your machine as high as it can go, you'll kind of mimic what a triangle wave does. So a quick little recap here. Our machine amperage gets set to one amp per thousandth of an inch of material thickness. You always want to target it to that. You can go a little bit lower, you can go a little bit higher, but keep it in that range. Don't load the pedal up. 120 hertz will weld anything that is pretty much prepped. Uh, I'd say about three sixteenths of an inch on down to pretty thin stuff. So if you want a general reference of where to set the machine or a baseline of where to run off of, or maybe even a set it and forget it kind of thing, 120 hertz will definitely do the job. 30% positive to 70% negative is our balance. Make sure you know which side of the machine that your machine works on or which side it references when it goes to it. 30-70 is the best place to start, and of course you can change any one of these settings if you want. But if you ever have a runaway situation where you've changed every setting and you're like, whoa, I need to, I don't know what the heck is going on, always revert right back to this because this will weld everything. Well, that about wraps it up for aluminum theory. Pretty sure I covered all of it. Really hope this helps you out. It's a lot of information to absorb, but at least now you know what your coaches know. And now you don't have to waste a bunch of time trying to figure all this stuff out. You can rewind this video, look back at it, check out the different chapters in case you weren't sure. It's awesome. That means that you're gonna go straight into welding as soon as your session starts with your coach. It's genius, right? It's awesome. Not wasting time. And if you're new here, thanks for watching all the way to the end. Go check out weldcoach.com if you wanna learn how to weld. You get your own one-on-one -on -one instructor, like anywhere, anytime that they're available. Book a class, the metal shows up, open your phone, get on a tablet, computer, 
Doesn't matter what device you have. Nothing to download, no apps, no extensions, no subscriptions. You get an actual person on the other end. Pretty cool, huh? Well, I hope to see you all over there because I teach there too. <laughs>